welcome to this discussion. Actually, you know, this discussion, I will, my task tonight would be uh, how can we read the uh, situation in Palestine within a context, within a historical context, and within the balance of power that the world and the region are uh, going through at this moment in time. I would like first to uh, actually read it from inside out. It means I'm going to start from the Palestinian uh, situation uh, and position. As you know, the Palestinians uh, have been under occupation and this occupation uh, started first in 1948 and then 1967. And then after that, a process was established in order to contain anything called uh, uh, the rights of the Palestinians or the struggle, uh, Palestinian struggle for independence and freedom and liberty. And that peace process, which started in 1993, uh, promised the Palestinians a state at the end of, uh, of, of the uh, interim period and established uh, the Palestinian National Authority uh, in Oslo. And that became on its own some form of a proposed exit for the conflict that uh, had been actually going on for a long time. Now, I would like now to say the following. The Palestinians since Oslo lost their campus, means they did not exactly understand what could be the end solution or the end target because deep rift within the Palestinians started to emerge. People who supported also 1993 and people who thought that this is not going to lead us anywhere. However, the Palestinian National Authority, part of its commitment to Oslo and, and part of its actually makeup is to play a major role in containing the Palestinian uh, resistance against the occupation and to cooperate with the Israelis on matters of security. Now, time has passed, as you have seen, and Palestinian National Authority and, of course, PLO, which was weakened to a large extent, gave up on issues called uh, military uh, resistance. And they adopted the diplomatic approach, political approach, thinking that the world eventually is going to support that kind of approach and will force the Israelis to give us the, the rights of independence and statehood. Now, we discovered, not very far actually, even when Yasser Arafat was still alive, that the peace process and the so-called Oslo agreement is not taking us anywhere, but it is empowering the Israelis and it is actually uh, putting the Palestinians within cantons, within some form of isolation uh, entities uh, that can never be or will never lead to a state. And it will always drain their resources internally and create major conflicts within them. Yes, Arafat wanted to adjust that, wanted to do something, uh, even to support some form of resistance. And I think Yasser Arafat in a way or another, was supportive without announcing the uh, uh, operations that Hamas conducted during his life. This is why Yasser Arafat was seen as an obstacle. He was killed by the Israelis, was assassinated and poisoned, and he lost uh, his life. Now, the current administration, the Palestinian National Administration under Mahmoud Abbas, continued the commitment that was established in 1993, and started to demand uh, the rights, but of course, uh, nothing happened actually. Now, within that kind of atmosphere, we see that Gaza started to establish itself. Now, let me go back to 1987. 1987, the Intifada started. In 1987, the first Intifada, when people broke the fear of the Israeli military, by throwing stones. In 2000, the Palestinians had the second intifada, 
when they actually used force, I mean, used military uh, operations against the Israelis, especially Hamas. And then after that, we did not have intifadas per se, but we had three wars that started uh, in Gaza, between Gaza and the Israelis. Now, what is important about this formula is the following. When the track that was established in Oslo reached its dead end, the Palestinians adjusted their, uh, their uh, tools of resistance and they evolved into another level and they started developing their mechanisms in order to continue their struggle. And the Palestinian National Authority kept itself in the corner or the one square meter that was defined in Oslo 1993 and became very clear to every Palestinian who is living in West Bank that the Palestinian National Authority is nothing but uh, a guardian of the Israeli occupation when it comes to any form of resistance against the Israelis. Now, the current situation has led to the following. For the first time, A, Gaza has claimed the uh, representation of the Palestinian cause more than any other war before this one. Why? Because it was revolving around not the rights of the people of Gaza to uh, health care and to education and uh, the left of the blockade. This time it was actually because of Jerusalem and the Masjid al-Aqsa. Now that is, in my opinion, a turning point. Why? Because it is not a matter of Gaza now. It is a matter of the symbolic and the most important asset that the Palestinians have, which is Al-Masjid al-Aqsa and Al-Quds, Jerusalem. And when Hamas start defending that, it means that they have picked up on the legitimate struggle of the Palestinians in order to protect and save their, uh, their uh, holy uh, uh, mosque. And that the Palestinian Authority never did. And that the Arab governments during the last maybe 30 years did not really do. So when the campus of the Palestinians was corrected and it turned to become a struggle for Jerusalem, suddenly we discovered that all components of Palestinian uh, communities in 1948, who, are, who used to be called um, uh, the, the Israeli Arabs, not anymore. The people in West Bank under the uh, current administration, Palestinian Authority, and of course the people in Gaza have been united. It means the historical Palestine, the historical land of Palestine, 1948 onward, for the first time since 1948, 72 years, have been united on one cause, which is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Beside that, for the first time also, we see that Hamas has upgraded its discourse from trying to achieve certain um, uh, privileges or even rights uh, and, and to break away from the uh, suffocating sanctions uh, and the blockade into something else, into a major force that no one can do anything about the Palestinian issue without taking it into consideration. And we have seen that the Palestinian National Authority, PLA, with its also uh, major failure during the last uh, uh, two decades, have reached also its end in a sense that everything happened without PLA being involved in it or even consulted uh, when it ended. So that is very important strategic development. Now we can say for the first time that the Palestinians have united in about the political factions. They have united themselves around a cause and that cause is of course very crucial to the Palestinians. Let us go to the Israelis as well. The Israelis have been going before this uh, uh, war, they have been going through their golden moment in the region. Why? Because first they had Trump who gave them uh, a lot of things, including Jerusalem 
and of course Golan Heights, and uh, he uh, even acknowledged the right of the Israelis to start thinking of annexing the uh, Jordan Valley and, and the parts of West Bank. And of course, within it, of course, the deal of the century where some Arab governments, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, uh, Morocco, and even uh, some other, Saudi Arabia started some talks about it, where they approached the Israelis. Some of them signed uh, something called Abraham uh, Deal or Abraham Accords. And that gave the Israelis the following impression that the Palestinian cause is not any more important to the Arabs. And at this time, whatever we do, we can actually implement without major uh, contradiction with anyone in the region. And this is why they started accelerating plans that they had previously. One of these major plans is how to control the to control East Jerusalem and to replace the Palestinians who are living around Al-Masjid al-Aqsa, Al-Haram al-Sharif, and to replace them with Israeli settlers as a first step towards establishing something which they call the uh, holy uh, uh, you know, sphere or al-Hawd al-Muqaddas, uh, where all of Al-Masjid al-Aqsa is surrounded by Israeli uh, uh, neighborhood, and that will lead eventually to either dividing Al-Masjid al-Aqsa, like what they did with Al-Masjid al-Ibrahimi in Hebron, or even taking over it and converting it into uh, the temple, uh, where a lot of Israeli settler groups uh, and the religious uh, right-wing groups actually believe that this is the major target. Not only actually uh, right-wing groups, uh, mainstream politicians even think that this is what should happen. Beside that, the current polarization within the Israeli society has led, this is for, we had four elections before this and they failed to establish a government. Netanyahu was scared of going to jail and therefore he deliberately gave the right-wing uh, Jewish settlers the right to provoke the Palestinians in, in the Masjid al-Aqsa, supported by the army, where the whole world during the last 10 days of Ramadan witnessed how the brutality against the uh, civilian uh, 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 men and women inside the Masjid al-Aqsa was conducted. And that, in my opinion, was a target deliberately done by Netanyahu in order to create some form of legitimacy for himself, because he knows that this is will provoke the Palestinians in West Bank and the Gaza, and then he will not uh, be uh, dismissed from the government. Now, in my opinion, he made a major mistake, of course, but of course he saved also his government. It seems that for now, Netanyahu is still there. Now, what happened in Israel? In my opinion, they did not expect the kind of power that Gaza did show in this war. They did not expect the scope and the distance and the targets that the uh, resistance in Gaza did actually uh, uh, show during this period. And this was not playing very well with that, with the Israeli army or with the Israeli government because they could not establish a proper target or they could not achieve something visible to show to their audience inside Israel or outside by killing certain leaders of Hamas or eradicating the power of the resistance. Uh, all of them have been talking about the metro of Hamas and uh, they said we have destroyed about 100 kilometer of tunnels and that Gaza. Hamas yesterday responded by saying that the city under Gaza, the metro, the, the, uh, the quality tunnels are actually about 500 kilometers. And you are lying because nothing was then, uh, was, was destroyed as you have mentioned. And they have declared only 57 uh, fighters being killed in this confrontation. And this is a major failure for the Israeli army, it never happened before. It means that the Palestinian resistance has been able to evolve and to learn from the past and to develop something in you. And of course, if you know what Gaza is, you will understand how difficult that is. I mean, this is like an impossible mission. 
to do whatever they have done, but they have done it. So when it comes to the Palestinians, they have found eventually a, you know, a direction that could unify them, unify all Palestinian components within the historical Palestine. And if you think about the Israelis, they have become much more, much more confused because what happened now ended without any clear uh, victory or even a truce, a permanent truce. So therefore they are going to continue to be under threat. And this is not going to play very well with the Israeli society. And uh, this sign of uh, losing initiative by the Israeli army will of course have uh, uh, major consequences in the future. Now, this is about the, so when you speak about Palestine, Palestine, Israeli party uh, conflict, Definitely the Palestinians won on the ground. And the, the plus is for the Palestinians. On, and, and definitely this is a turning point, never having before that we had the 1948 Palestinians revolting. We have never, even from 1993, uh, the Intifada inside West Bank was always contained by the Palestinian Authority. This time, I think Palestinian Authority lost the initiative. So this is extremely important to notice and to witness. Now let us go to the region. On the regional level, again, let us put the context. From 1967, uh, during 1967 war, when the Israelis occupied Jerusalem and West Bank, Golan Heights, and, and Sinai Desert. Uh, actually, the region, regional powers, besides the, some Arab countries, were supportive of the Israelis. And I mean, in particular, Iran and Turkey. Iran was providing the Israelis with oil. Every tank, every jet fighter fought against the Arabs in the 1967 war was actually fueled by Iranian oil. Beside that, Iran, uh, sorry, Israel had uh, some form of alliance with Turkey during that period. Now, come to the current reality. The Iranians are not pro-Israel anymore. Actually, the Israelis and the Iranians have major conflict amongst each other, and there is a war taking basically a low intensity confrontation taking place. And you have seen and heard about the, the, the targets uh, that uh, mutually uh, attacked uh, by both parties against each other. And of course, Turkey is not anymore with Israel. And Turkey has gained in the region a status, power, and developed its military to a large extent where the Israelis actually also regard it as an, uh, a major, uh, uh, maybe enemy even. But in this case, the two major countries in this region are not anymore with the Israelis. This is extremely important development that we should notice. The region, when it comes to the Arabs, they signed agreements with the Israelis. The first agreement was signed by the Egyptians in 1980, Camp David Agreement. And then after that, uh, the Jordanians signed also peace agreement with, with uh, the Israelis. And of course, during the last few months, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, and the Moroccans signed also, and Sudanese signed agreements with the Israelis. And that, on its own, became the golden moment for the Israelis as well, because regionally they thought right now that they are secure. During Trump era, I mean, they felt that they're in power and therefore regionally speaking, they cannot think of a major threat attacking them from the region. Besides their reading to the region, Iraq, which was a major force in the region, is in a way going through major uh, transformation and, and um, conflicts. Uh, Syria is going through a civil war, which also used to be a major threat against the Israelis. Lebanon went through major, complications during the last few months. Therefore, Israel feels, looking around, that there is no one really to contain them when it comes to uh, matters of uh, dealing with the Palestinians or dealing with, with Jerusalem. Now, of course, someone will argue that Iran, yes, Iran definitely is against the Israelis, and there is no doubt that the, Iranian, the Israelis see the Iranians and the Turks as rivals and enemies in the region. But of course, each one of them has constraints of action against the Israelis. So the Iranians have the negotiations was supposed to happen in order to resolve the issue of nuclear weapons uh, or nuclear enrichment. 
And of course, Turkey is part of the NATO and they cannot do much because of the commitment to uh, uh, the, the NATO agreement. Now, the Israelis thought that the Arabs have lost attachment to Palestine. And now each one of them is negotiating a separate deal. Some of it economic, some of it intelligence, some of it related to regional uh, architecture. And when this war took place, because of the Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, we found that the Arabs everywhere in this region did first go against the will of their governments by demonstrating, by expressing their frustration and anger, unified on one cause, which is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem and defending the right of Palestinians in Hay Sheikh Jarrah and in other uh, uh, suburbs in, in, in Jerusalem. And they actually went way beyond any expectation in that support. Why? In countries where they had peace process with Israel, let us take Egypt, for example, which is the oldest Arab country that signed a treaty with Israel, they, the, even the Egyptian current administration, current government, found themselves obliged to show strict and tough stance against the Israelis and to show support to the people of Palestine, including the people in Gaza. And we have seen this after a few days of the war. I mean, the third and fourth day of the war, we started to see a major change in the attitude of the Egyptians who previously in the war of 2014 were not actually pro-Hamas at all and we, they were um, uh, uh, hoping that Hamas would be destroyed because the theory then that Hamas is part of Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas is regarded in Egypt as a major uh, problem and the threat, and therefore they would love to see Hamas being uh, weakened. But during this war, the attitude changed for many reasons. One of these reasons, of course, the public, public opinion. I mean, eventually you are talking about a Masjid al aqsa which is extremely important for everyone. But also Egypt thought that they have lost their position in the region when the Emiratis started to speak to the Israelis and started to even develop projects that might endanger the uh, Egyptian national security like the an alternative, the, the two uh, seas uh, canal, which might create a problem for the Egyptians. Besides the fact that Egypt used officially to be this, I mean, the, the representative internationally of the Palestinians in Gaza. So when everyone, anyone would like to talk to Hamas, he will come to, uh, to Egypt. Now, Egypt thought that this is a great opportunity to reclaim its position, and they did that. And suddenly, everyone started talking to Egypt again in order to pass messages to Hamas. Egypt, Qatar, basically played the most important role of creating a, a, a truce uh, or a ceasefire from both sides. This is extremely important, and this is major development. The Egyptian shift towards the Palestinian issue is something that you need to notice very much and to take into consideration. And in my opinion, the rest of the Arab governments, including governments who have just recently signed with Israel, they could not but condemn also the Israeli atrocities against the Masjid al -Qasar. Now, the third circle, which is the international, the Islamic one, the Islamic one is extremely important because it could be motivated by Masjid al -Qasar more than being motivated by the human rights of the Palestinians or their right of self-independence. Uh, uh, self, uh, uh, and in my opinion, uh, one and a half billion Muslims will always continue to think of Masjid al-Aqsa as their mosque. And that is extremely vital and important. And the Israelis might have not thought about it because also in, I found that the Israelis and the Western approach to the Palestinian issue always is superficial and always does not have the depth to understand something called Ummah, something called the sensitivity of having, of, 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 of uh, humiliating the Ummah through attacking uh, their sacred mosque. Uh, they couldn't understand that because eventually they read geopolitics through states. People are not important, in my opinion, in their calculations. Now, we understand that our states are weak they are not representing 
the collective will of the people. So when you only look at the state position about Israel or Palestine, you will misunderstand the actual reality on the ground because people do not have the same opinion like states. They are much more authentic in their appreciation to their uh, holy sites and in their support to the Palestinians in large. So I think also that major battle was lost by the Israelis. The fourth circle is the internet. National one. The Palestinian narrative was always uh, introduced by media uh, during the last 30, 40 years or more that is friendly to the Israelis in capitals that are pro Israelis. And we know Israel eventually is a product of the Second World War. And the Israelis have maintained impunity. Uh, internationally in all forms because of the support that they gained from Western powers and the United States of America. And therefore, they had nothing to fear. They could do much. And even the terminology that media organizations used to have for the Palestinians, for example, take the CNN during the Intifada, the, the first Intifada and the second Intifada. The word Intifada was not mentioned by them. They used to say, uh, you know, uh, Palestinian violence, for example. Uh, the world uh, Palestine was not mentioned. Uh, settlers, they used to call it uh, Israeli neighborhood. Uh, occupation was not mentioned. The word occupation was not mentioned. So the mainstream media, which was dominating the narrative, was following the same line of the official line of the state in defending the Israelis and giving them a green light to do whatever they want to do and to be protected and covered, actually, and even to deceive the public by creating a narrative which did not have roots. So eventually, if you are a regular audience of CNN or even BBC or many other platforms in the 80s and 90s, you would think that the Palestinians are irrational people who are just creating troubles to the peaceful, democratic Israelis. And we don't know why. You know, I mean, the word occupation is not there. People don't understand that this is a struggle for liberation. And that created, in my opinion, a major narrative which was established definitely within the media circuit, mainstream media and international uh, politics. But people now own uh, smartphones and each person can narrate his narrative to the world. And we have seen it during the last, uh, the, the last uh, confrontation that the world has shifted its attitude about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict towards the Palestinians against the Israelis. This is a fact. No, I can see it everywhere. To an extent that when Associated Press, for example, fired a journalist or a Jewish journalist who tweeted when she was in the university, pro-Palestine, they have been forced now to, in a way, revise this issue and people are pressurizing them to, to adjust their policies. Uh, it was a major, of course, uh, hypocritic move, which in my opinion is something that uh, media organizations, respected media organizations should never have done. But anyway, that has been done. You have seen also what happened with Facebook when they wanted to suffocate the Palestinian narrative, what happened also with, with Instagram, what happened with now Amazon. Everyone from the public, not governments, have started to realize that there was a lot of deception. And also, let me be frank with you, that the narrative from the Palestinians has become much more clear, much more sharp, uh, much more vocal. And we have a new generation of uh, English-speaking Palestinians, educated, well-educated, who can express the way, their way, uh, their opinion. And I think the world is listening. To a large extent, that uh, the current administration, which is Biden administration, although they expressed full support to the Israelis, in my opinion, they did not have the same support that previous administrations had to Israel, because the rift within the Democratic Party, and for the first time we see under the Congress, members uh, condemning the Israeli atrocities against the Palestinians. This is very important development. Some people would say that this is not necessarily done because of good hearts of people who are defending the Palestinians, but also because the international balance of power, and this is my last observation, international balance of power is shifting. Uh, 
Israel was established to guard the international or the Western interest in the Middle East. Oil at that time was important for the British and for the Americans. And in my opinion, Israel was the most successful enterprise that the Western order established in order to guard their interest in the region and to divide the region and to stop it from reclaiming its uh, right or and sovereignty when it comes to wealth and it comes to territories as well. Now, oil is not important anymore in the region. The international priorities are shifting. The American major national security issue is China, is not anymore the Middle East, not even terrorism as it used to be during George Bush era. So is Israel actually suitable to guard the Western interest in the region or the cost, moral cost, ethical cost, and financial cost of continuing to support blindly the Israelis uh, against the Palestinians and against the region is actually becoming at this moment in time too expensive to sustain. This is in my opinion happening right now. It has not yet reached its final conclusion, which in my opinion, it will one day. But if you think about the care of Palestinian struggle from 1987 onward, you will find that it is actually going up. Every confrontation is becoming much more sophisticated and efficient than the previous confrontation. And if you think about the status of Israel in the world, it is going down. Every turning point, people are waking up to the fact that Israel is an apartheid state. And that word used to be very rarely used, actually. Now I see a lot of people using the apartheid state to, to, to describe the Israelis and the discrimination against Palestinians and the uh, uprooting of the culture and, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, trying to replace the people and staying their houses. This is a discourse which has become now normal. In my opinion, it is important to notice it. And I would say that this discourse is encouraged by new thinking emerging everywhere in the world, whereby people now can communicate with facts directly rather than having these facts filtered and framed by main news organizations or by governments. People have the freedom now uh, and the privilege to be able to communicate directly. I mean, we have been listening and watching events in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa through cell phones live streamed to everywhere in the world. So you don't need someone to sit down and to describe to you a lot or to frame it in, in, in a terminology or in a uh, certain kind of, of editing which lead to misguidance and misinterpretation of events. This is extremely important and vital uh, that is happening. The, the so-called deal of the century, as we predicted, is gone. There is nothing called deal of the century right now. The so-called normalization is becoming a disgrace for those who have normalized without, without even mentioning the old Palestine in their, in their agreements with Israel. And in my opinion, the most important within the Palestinian camp that the people of 1948, the Palestinians who are still living within the territory of Israel. And people who have Israeli citizenship, now the world could see how this state is discriminating against citizens by giving Jews much more privileged in every sense, institutionalized, legal, actually discrimination taking place in the eyes of the, in front of the people in the world. So definitely, this is very clear apartheid, and that word should be used always to describe the state of Israel. And I don't think that Israel will recover from this. It is a moment, a turning point in our history. And I think from now on, the Palestinians have to start thinking of themselves on another level of struggle. And of course, the world will start thinking and the region about Israel as a major liability rather than a major opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wadlah. Uh, this has been very uh, uh, informative. 
Uh, I have some questions uh, of my own, meanwhile, until the questions start coming up. Uh, so you have mentioned several of the advancements, if I might call them. Some of them are like the, the unification of the Palestinians uh, across the different components of the Palestinian uh, um, people. Then uh, you mentioned the shift in the uh, public opinion uh, on an international level as well, the end of normalization attempts. Uh, amongst others. How do you think these um, advancements or gains can be preserved and advanced and leveraged? Uh, meanwhile, as we see um, the Israeli uh, government trying to empty uh, the political effect of these uh, new developments, we see, um, we see Netanyahu trying to say that, see, I can always go into the mosque and raid it, Al-Aqsa Mosque, even regardless of what uh, Hamas tried to do. He's trying to also uh, continue with the settlement uh, issue as if the, the Gaza uh, uh, war did not have any political um, effect on him. So how, how, do, you, how do you see that? Uh, first, when it comes to the Palestinian front, I think right now the current Palestinian struggle is not properly framed. Uh, why? Because before we used to have the first phase of the struggle, we had Palestinian uh, liberation, PLO. And PLO did play a major role internationally in the 60s, in the 70s, even in the 80s, uh, and gained certain international recognition and so on. But that led to the Palestinian National Authority, which in my opinion, did kill uh, PLO. Now the question which I'm asking, and Palestinians should be able to answer uh, and should have debate about it. What is the best platform that, Palesti that should represent Palestinians? PLO, can it be resurrected? I don't think it is easy to answer that question because PLO was basically a forum that brings together factions uh, represented based on their weight within the struggle. But today, uh, these factions who did form the presidential organization are not actually uh, that important within the struggle, while Hamas, which is the most important amongst them, is not part of PLO. So this is important question. The second one, the Palestinians have been divided into three major uh, territories those who are living in 1948, those who are living in West Bank, and those who are living in Gaza, besides, of course, those who are living in diaspora. Now, any frame of Palestinian struggle should include these four components. It does not work that a group or uh, a movement can only uh, be based or claim uh, a representation of certain sector of the society. And therefore, I think, we have at this stage an opportunity to come up with something that could bring all the Palestinians together and unite their voices and project that voice to the, to the world as a first step towards representing the Palestinian cause based on uh, uh, general uh, representation of Palestinian components everywhere in the world. Uh, this is when it comes to the Palestinians. The second one, when it comes to the Israelis, Netanyahu still, and is going to actually be very close to the right-wing religious movements. For them, for him, this is very crucial to form a new government. His uh, opponents as well are going to do so. We have to acknowledge that the Israeli society during the last few years have gone to the extreme, to the right extreme. And it is not, I mean, the so-called uh, liberal parties in Israel, uh, the so-called leftist groups of Israel, have uh, lost a lot during the last few uh, years. And now the rising uh, power of extreme uh, nationalist or extreme religious groups is actually going up. And therefore, any government in the future is going to be to, to try to get them into, into power. And this will eventually have some kind of repercussions on the way that the Israelis see themselves. Because in this case, they need to give the settlers and to the religious groups, give them a certain kind of uh, rewards. Amongst them could be uh, the issue of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, could be Jerusalem, of course, and the, uh, the, the evacuation of Palestinians. 
And that will always continue to be a major problem. This is why I believe personally that the battle for Jerusalem has just started. It did not end. It has just started. Because if you understand the Israeli mind, you will understand that for them, this is going to be a beginning. And if you understand them, the Arab, Muslim, Palestinian mind, you will also understand for them, this is not going to be forgotten or dealt with easily. And this is why I think we are just witnessing the first episode of something that is going to be much more complicated during the next few years. And I predict that the Israelis are actually heading towards a major disaster when it comes to the way that they perceive themselves in the region and in the world. And they, uh, unfortunately, or I mean, I don't know if they are trying to read it rightly, but what is happening, it seems that there is no turning point. It seems that I am not feeling that tomorrow we are going to see an Israeli government coming out and trying to make a deal with the Palestinians and to withdraw from West Bank and, and, and East Jerusalem and give it to the Palestinians to establish a state. I don't see this happening, uh, in fact. But I see the Israelis heading towards much more extreme approach, security approach, um, brutal approach against the Palestinians, which will trigger more resistance, trigger more opposition in the region and internationally, which is going to be definitely uh, very complicated and difficult during the next few years. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wadah. Uh, I'll take the question of uh, Tanbisa and uh, ask him to unmute, please, and then I'll go for the questions in the chat box. Uh, Tanbisa, please, would you like to uh, ask your question? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you well. Yes, the question is, how? what advice do we have for Hamas uh, moving forward? How they? How can they fight the war and claim the spoils? Because right now, they fight the war, but the spoils go to Fatah or Mr. Mahmoud Abbas. So what, what advice can you give to Hamas moving forward on how to, to fight and, and, and at the same time claim the spoils. The second question, which is related to what I've just asked, is, is there a way that Hamas can graduate from just being a grassroots uh, organization into a, a much more representative of the Palestinians in total that can negotiate on behalf of the Palestinians and became some sort of diplomatic, you know, uh, diplomatic parallels uh, towards trying to solve the, the problems that we find both in the West Bank and in Gaza? Okay, the, the first uh, question, I do believe that Hamas should widen its, its uh, representation and uh, should have much bigger uh, approach to various Palestinian communities and include them within it. Uh, I think the time has come now for Hamas to graduate from being a movement which was established on a certain ideological framework. But that will continue, of course, but it should continue within a wider representation of Palestinian uh, opinions and Palestinian sectors of the society. And uh, if you look at what happened during this war, I think it was a major step to build on by addressing an issue, which is the uh, Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem and uh, Hayy Sheikh Jarrah, in a way that everyone in Palestine, including those who are not religious, uh, did support Hamas. Uh, I think they should build on it. I think they should graduate into a wider discourse that could uh, embrace much wider uh, audience and uh, uh, become a little bit uh, uh, you know, unifying factor for all Palestinian uh, communities. The second also important element, which you asked, how could they become a political force? I don't think at this current status uh, that we are in internationally, and we have seen, you see the West in a way, and, and I speak in directly about Germany and France, and of course the United States of America, uh, and many other small states in Europe as well, uh, beside the Northern Europe. Most of them actually have 
publicly supported uh, Israel in a way which was actually very insulting and very stupid, uh, in my opinion. And we have heard today the speeches done in, in the Human Rights Council, where the U European Union statement was extremely weak, very weak. Uh, while other countries in the north, Sweden, uh, Norway, Finland, uh, Baltic, and, and the Scandinavian states, did actually deliver another speech where they did mention the Palestinian right uh, clearly. The United, the European Union official statement did not. Uh, I don't think Europe is important, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think really that we Palestinians should always uh, chase uh, uh, behind a European opinion, official opinion. I think we should be smart enough to speak to Europeans, to European people, uh, and to American people. Uh, and we should not uh, be affected uh, by the um, European stance, uh, governmental stance, because this will continue to be supportive of Israel. But if you gain on the ground something that they cannot but talk to you, they will eventually talk to you. And we have seen people, politicians even, during the last few days, saying that, you know what, if you are going to deal with Gaza, you cannot actually deal with Gaza without dealing with Hamas. So in, in, on one hand, Hamas should not play the political game, which Mahmoud Abbas did play. On another hand, they should have their power where the world is going to listen to them and talk to them while they are widening their representation and their discourse in order to become more uh, representing uh, of various Palestinian uh, uh, opinions and, and ideologies. So that will be extremely important. The time for politics will come one day. The time for politics will come, but to be obsessed by the idea that you would like to be hosted on the table of negotiations, for example, I do think is very useful because we have seen what happened uh, to um, Yasser Arafat and to Mahmoud Abbas when they did think that the international uh, opinion, uh, I mean the formal international opinion, is going to favor them and give them their rights. They have failed in that dismally. And uh, I know, and I have said this many times, people do not respect the weak. And uh, I think uh, eventually they will come to their senses when they realize that this conflict can never end just by uh, supporting Israel unconditionally and trying to weaken the narrative of the Palestinians and to evade talking about occupation and to talk about the Israeli atrocities. I mean, when I hear a statement of, of uh, officials saying, you know, Israel has the right to defend itself, we recognize the right of them, and no one ever mentioned the right of the Palestinians to liberate themselves, the right of the Palestinians to defend themselves. So this is hypocritic, and I don't think we should really take care about it. I mean, I think we should be now being part of it in order to realize exactly our own uh, uh, power. Our own, our own influence should be within people. Uh, we people, the people of the uh, Arab world, the people of the Muslim world, the people of the world. Uh, we should definitely present our case to everyone and own our narrative. Then after that, politics will follow. Thank you very much, Mr. Rodah. That was extremely uh, important. Uh, one question that follows up on uh, what you were just saying. Uh, so Yusuf is asking, as part of seeing the fractures and nuances within the Western powers that protect and support Israel, what would be the best way uh, for us to support movements that are critical to Israel in the US, for example, like the Justice Democrats movements, the Congress members, Black Lives Matter, and so on? I have been a great advocate of the idea that we should be part of this global uh, human values that we share with a lot of people in the world. And I think we, the Palestinian issue is a major uh, inter ent entrance into that uh, arena. Uh, we have very clear cause. We need to own the narrative. We need to uh, make huge awareness about it everywhere we go. Uh, and that is actually necessary. I'm not saying because we need to support the Palestinians. Don't misunderstand me, because some people think uh, that the Palestinians are suffering. And, you know, since they are suffering, we have an obligation 
to ease their suffering. It is not about the human rights of the Palestinians. It's not about sanctions against Gaza. It's not only about uh, properties confiscated. In my opinion, it is much bigger than that. It is a human stance that you need to take for justice and equality uh, internationally. And uh, I, I am a great advocate of the idea that even Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, should lead the fight for, uh, uh, for freedom and liberty and uh, human rights and equality and justice internationally. I mean, this is basically one of our, the pillars of our uh, culture and religion. It's one of the major uh, recommendations, not recommend obligations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran even mentioned. So we should go ahead with it. And uh, I realized also something important. No one did normalize with Israel and won. No one. Uh, they could not win. Uh, actually, they lost this uh, game because uh, they did side with the wrong uh, uh, party. In my opinion, uh, when we stand for something that is just like the Palestinian issue, which is very clear to anyone who can have access to facts, basic facts, not even philosophical or intellectual, uh, is going to gain uh, a lot of power. Uh, and I do believe in the power of supporting the Palestinian cause and working for Palestine uh, as a major motivation to establish uh, organizations and to establish uh, circles uh, uh, and civilian groups across the world. And this is because any group needs a cause, and uh, one day when the left was uh, was very uh, powerful in the world, PLO succeeded to capitalize on the leftist groups and presented their cause as a cause of the oppressed. And of course that died away because PLO seems to be important right now or active. And in my opinion, there is a major tendency internationally towards a new movement, and this movement includes people from various backgrounds, people who fight for uh, climate, people who fight for environment, people who fight for human rights, people who fight for independence. These people should own the cause. And the discourse should be developed for each audience. I think we have not developed the proper discourse for international audience. Maybe we started now, maybe during the last few weeks, there was a new discourse, new terminology, uh, new tools uh, that should be sustained. So in short, it is a matter of awareness and it is a matter of joining hand with everyone who is willing to fight, not only for Palestine, but for every Nobel cause in the world. And I ask you, we should not also be seen that we only uh, motivated by a Muslim cause or by a Palestinian cause. We should always stand for justice wherever it is, in any country, wherever there is aggression against human rights or against people or against their liberty or equality or justice, we should stand for that. And this is how the world could be much better world. And this is how the world could stand with us when uh, that is needed as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wadah, maybe going back to um, more of a political um, question. So uh, the two-state solution have been declared that uh, with, like, with the Trump uh, attempts and the, uh, um, and the later developments on the ground and the behavior of, of, uh, of the Israeli government in Jerusalem, the status uh, that it's trying to um, uh, enforce on the ground. Uh, but now with the coming of Biden, with the, we see a strong attempt to uh, revitalize uh, the two-state solution. Uh, do you think that this, uh, or how do you think that's, that will play out? Uh, and how will that affect the uh, Palestinian struggle? You see that the two-state solution is uh, a very, it's dead. And in, in my opinion, there is a huge lack of imagination internationally about the Palestinian issue. So this is why whenever they would like to save Israel from its major uh, faults and mistakes, they come back with, the, with two ideas. A, resume the peace process. B, 
two-state solution. Always, that is the rhetoric that only comes whenever Israel is uh, under threat. And in my opinion, they rushed everyone. I mean, you saw the ministers of foreign affairs rushing to Israel to give them support and also giving support to the Palestinian National Authority, to Mahmoud Abbas, by saying it is very urgent and important to uh, start uh, uh, the peace process again, which will take us nowhere. I mean, can you really convince the Palestinians that the peace of process? I mean, I remember that when I was in Al Jazeera, I was uh, reading through the documents of the negotiations uh, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Al Jazeera did the huge uh, work on it uh, that was leaked to us, and then we published it. Uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, it can't actually the logic of the Israeli negotiators was impossible to accept to be accepted by any Palestinian. Uh, so there is no, in my opinion, this track is closed. And if the international uh, powers would like to receive a peace process based on the foundations that they have been repeating the quartet and uh, the exclusion of Hamas and uh, you know the two-state solution and so on and so forth, that is not going to be welcomed by anyone. It's not going to have any impact. It could become a matter of uh, uh, corridors politics or a matter of closed boardroom politics, but it's not going to be a popular uh, narrative within the Palestinian communities that people will say, oh my God, a new process has started, let us wait and calm down. Because we have seen this, we have seen this tens of times and it did not lead but to more humiliation, more discrimination, uh, much more confiscation of land, and much more uh, harm uh, against the Palestinians. So I don't think that is going to be a solution. What the solution should be? In my opinion, the Israelis are not willing to really discuss a serious solution. I have been advocating the idea that Israel is in the region, but not part of the region. The, Israel does not want to see itself as part of the region. And that's an impossible situation. When you are defining your state, as a Jewish state, you are excluding basically more than 20% of your citizens who you're supposed to uh, deal with them in a democratic, so-called democratic state equally, but that has never happened. And uh, that state is always becoming much more extreme with time, much more radicalized with time, much more right-wing with time. In a region which is dominated by, for centuries, by mosaic of cultures and mosaic of groups and so on. And uh, uh, we could have uh, you know, accommodated any religion in the region. And we have did um, accommodate actually the Jews in particular. Uh, I always remind people that during the Roman Empire, 400 years, the Jews were not allowed to enter Jerusalem. Uh, only it was Omar al Khattab when he conquered Jerusalem that he did allow the Jews to enter Jerusalem because he thought that they have the right to travel wherever they like. And he lifted the ban on the Jews. And since then, Muslims in this part of the world did accommodate, accommodate Jews without any complication. We have never thought that this is going to be a complication that we, you know, we are going to uh, uh, work against. I mean, it's not true. I mean, this region has been tolerant. But the, the Zionist project, itself is not actually tolerant to integration in the region. So if you are going to live in a castle surrounded by uh, security uh, arrangements, trying to demolish any um, uh, serious endeavor in the region for uh, claiming uh, independence or claiming sovereignty for, by any state, actually, not only the Palestinians, how on earth you could have peace you know, so I think we, the Israelis need to re-examine the major and the most important fundamental question. Would they really like to be part of this region? Or they would like to be in the region, surrounded by all kinds of means to separate them from the region? The second approach definitely will lead to conflict and will never uh, have uh, a peaceful uh, end.